Good morning. Thank God for Sunday morning. Amen? Amen? Because hope is happening right here at Way of Hope this morning. Thanks for coming out on this Sunday morning and joining us. It is a good morning. We're privileged to have you here with us. We're thankful for those online that are joining us. Uh, it's just good. Good to be here on a Sunday morning. Everybody have a good time last Sunday? Yes. Is that good? We had 95 here last week and... Uh, I was looking back over some of our attendance over the year. We've had some good, uh, big events. Uh, our Love Feast Communion last spring was well attended in the high 80s. Easter morning was in the mid 90s. Church picnic in the mid 90s. Uh, back to church uh, on the mid 90s. So thank you for inviting people and thank you uh, for continuing to uh, support the ministry here. Uh, we just uh, are blessed by that and we thank you uh, for it. So uh, again, welcome this morning to Way of Hope. I do want to remind you that next week uh, we're going to do a carry-in dinner again. Everybody clapped last week, remember, said we should do this again. Uh, <laughs> I know it's kind of back to back, but next week is World Communion Sunday. And that is uh, typically the Sunday that we uh, do love, feast, and communion together. If you're new with us, uh, worship will look pretty much the same as it typically does, except we'll take some time to uh, wash feet and wash hands. Uh, we'll have share bread and cup communion, and we uh, have a carry-in dinner. So what I'm encouraging you to do is think about that, what you can bring uh, for uh, your part of the carry-in. 
Uh, meet and place settings and drink and those kinds of things will be provided so you don't have to worry about that. But um, if you can bring a carry-in dinner and invite somebody to come with you, uh, that would be excellent. And we can enjoy another uh, good time of fellowship together and worship. I do have a sheet here that Denise wants me to pass around that if you can uh, just jot down something that you'd like to bring so we have a little bit of an idea. Uh, it's always helpful to kind of look over this and go, okay, we need a little of this or a little of that. And sometimes Denise makes a phone call and we get some help that way. So. Uh, since I always start this way, I'll start over here. Good morning, guys. Uh, if you can pass that around, I would appreciate it. Uh, this morning, our uh, centering words come from uh, Psalm uh, chapter 90, verse 12. And as I typically try to do on Sunday mornings, uh, our centering words are kind of a reminder to us of things that the Scripture says to us. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is one that's pretty deep and one that we should really think about pretty seriously. It says, teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. How do you uh, spend your days? And what do you waste your time on? And what time do you give to doing good? We only have so much time. How are you spending yours? Something to spend some time thinking deeply about. This time that we spend worshiping God is time well spent. Amen? It's something that we should prioritize in our life. Uh, we're going to talk about time over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so I'll get to that in a minute. But pray with me, and then uh, we got a couple extra to sing today. We'll sing two uh, this morning since we had some good singing last week. So join me as we pray, and I invite you to sing. Father, again, we thank you uh, that uh, you remind us that time is precious. Our lives are precious. The times that we're here on earth, Lord, living for you and serving you is precious. So Lord, today we thank you for this time that we can gather together in your name and to worship you and to lift your name on high and to just, uh, again, uh, look into the Gospels and look at uh, ways to uh, help our own lives uh, be better and more joyful and more at peace. So Lord, we ask today that you would guide us and help us. We're thankful to be here in the house of the Lord. We're uh, grateful that we can learn from you, Lord. So we pray that you open our hearts and minds to hear your words today. Lord, uh, we know that we're in a uh, spiritual battle in this world. Uh, we, we fight a real enemy uh, of evil. And we pray that uh, you would equip us, Lord, as we uh, sit here today to go out into the world and to continue to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we ask your blessings today. Guide us. Be with us. Use us. Help us to be all that you call us to be, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and uh, sing some prayers.
Praise the Lord that I don't have to fight every battle on my own. Amen? Amen. Have a seat this morning. Just to, uh, as we think about our stewardship time this morning, I just want to spend a little bit of time to say thank you uh, to all the volunteers and the help uh, for Back to Church Sunday last week. It's always awesome when everybody pitches in and, and helps out and uh, makes the work go a little bit easier. Uh, our teachers were awesome last week, if you didn't notice. Uh, as the kids were getting a little rambunctious, they all just kind of quietly sift through the whole congregation and kind of scoop them up and take them right back. So thank you uh, for that, uh, for taking care of our kids. That was awesome. And thank you for being inviters. Um, that's part of how the church continues to grow. You've got to keep inviting. As I said already, we had 95 here, and that's a great credit to you to invite people to come. You never know when the gospel is really going to sink in and land somewhere in someone's heart, and it's really going to start a, a, a fire in them to uh, really uh, build a relationship with Jesus. So invite, invite, invite. It was great singing last week, great food, great fellowship. It really was an awesome day, and uh, I want to thank you uh, all for that. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, and he says, I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. And everybody was working hard last week. He goes on and says, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And if you've experienced this promise, then you know for sure that it's true. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And it's, it, it's true. So here's the thought. Uh, remember the next time that you have a birthday or an anniversary or maybe even this Christmas when you're asked by somebody that loves you what you want as a gift? Uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a good response. Uh, what if you choose for your birthday or Christmas gifts to be a blessing to somebody else and you tell the person that's asking you what do you want uh, tell them, hey, uh, pick a charity, pick a ministry somewhere that you want people to give to you on your behalf as your gift. Um, and you'll live out those words that Jesus says that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Um, last week was some testimony to that. It was good uh, to see everybody kind of working together and giving of themselves. It is more blessed to give than receive. So pray with me this morning. Thank you again for your constant giving. Uh, it's a credit to you and it's a credit to the Lord uh, working through you. Father, again, uh, it is a true statement that it is a blessing to give more than it is to receive. Today, Lord, we're grateful to be uh, a part of your kingdom and uh, able to operate, Lord, in a way that we can share the gospel and we can give. But Lord, we wouldn't be honest if uh, we didn't also agree that it is good to receive sometimes. And we're grateful, Lord, to receive your blessings and your support and your encouragement. And we're thankful for that. And we extend our gratitude and praise to you, Lord, for it. Lord, our response to all of your goodness is to shine the light of Jesus back out into the world. To invite people to act like you act. To see the world in the way that you see it. To respond with compassion and mercy and grace. So Lord, today we're grateful that we have these opportunities and we're grateful that you continue to support us and encourage us and continue to keep um, the ministry here at Way of Hope moving forward. Lord, we pray that we can take every opportunity possible to preach the gospel in a way that uh, makes a difference in people's hearts and lives. Lord, we thank you for last weekend. We thank you for today that we can gather here together and raise uh, Jesus' name uh, without fear or without worry. Um, we're just grateful for all of this, this great country we live in and the great privileges that we have. So bless this time as we give, Lord. We give it to you in praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and give as the Lord lays on your heart. And sing. Sing. Sing loud.
Can we get back to the altar? Back to the arms of our first love. There's only one way to the Father, and He's calling out to us. To the captive, it looks like freedom. To the orphan, it feels like home. To the skeptic, it might sound crazy. To believe in a God who loves. In a world where our hearts are breaking, and we're lost in the mess we made. Good choice. This morning as uh, we work our way around for prayer requests, did you get lots of hand sanitizer girls? I love to pick on those too. I really do. Um, somebody back there, Dave, can you uh, run around with the mic? And just, uh, just a point about people who do things. You know, Dave is the guy Dave is the guy that Orange should be on. Dave is the guy that uh, whispers in Nancy's ear on Sundays. <laughs> Sounds bad. Let me finish. <laughs> or gives the coded signal to Owie of how many people are here. And every Sunday, he's the guy that knows there are 95 people here, or 59 people, or how many people are here today, Dave? 49. 49. Um, something that just happens that nobody knows about except for Dave and Owie and Nancy and I probably and Denise and that's really it. 
Uh, now everybody. But everybody should know that because it's one of those things that we keep track of and it's good to know because you ask me sometimes how many people were here and if Dave didn't count we wouldn't know. I'd just say there's a lot of people here. There was actually over 150 people here. You know preachers lie about that right you know. Hey, you ask another preacher how was your church service? Oh we had a lot of people there. How many people were there? Oh, I think 13. You know I mean so, so for some churches that's a lot of people so if it wouldn't be for Dave and you know Susie uh, also needs to get some credit too because uh, she's the one that really uh, stresses over all that happens behind the curtain. Um, she's not the Wizard of Oz but she really is a wizard in some ways because she makes uh, the Sunday school happen back there for the kids and you know I was thinking about this last week as uh, I was listening to the kids and the group was singing you know there are a lot of churches that do not have that beautiful sound of the kids kind of rushing around and, and talking and screaming and playing in the midst of them. And that never ever is a problem. That is always a good thing. Um, we're grateful for the parents that bring their children here and trust us with that. And we want you to know that. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you everybody for all of your work. Let's take some time for some prayer requests. How shall we pray this morning? Uh, good, Lot. We'll start with you in the back. Hi. If your dad and I are going to be traveling next weekend, I would just like some prayer for travel safety. Okay. Dad and Lottie traveling. Safe travel. Good deal. Okay. Nancy. Got any for the online folks? Please get them in so Nancy can share them. This one's from Janice Baker. Morning, Janice. Prayer request for Colin, a three-year-old child of a client who suddenly has high blood sugar, breathing, and needs to go to the ER at this Okay. So I want to keep little Colin in prayer. Okay. My spelling teacher would have a hard time. Can't spell sugar this morning. My goodness. Who else? Anybody? I, yeah, I see you guys already have Sierra out there, and I really, we both really appreciate it. Um, so just continue prayers for her complete total healing. She got a surgery coming surgery. on Wednesday, right? The 28th? Yep. Going to have double mastectomy, so please keep uh, their daughter Sierra in prayer again. Um, she's uh, 32 years old, so it's a, it's a tall decision to make for uh, a lady of that age. So please keep her in prayer. And uh, keep Mike and Lori in prayer too, right? Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. Um, my memory's not always so good, but <laughs> keep them in prayer too. Um, it's got to be hard being a parent dealing with that too. So others. Mr. Norris. Uh, just a praise for all the good that's been going on in my life lately, and also for my mom that her surgery is coming to fruition. Okay. And she has good results. All right. If you don't know, Mr. Norris is in the vending business, and he's been doing pretty well with that. So praises to God for that. And Jeannie as well, uh, whose uh, surgeries have been postponed, but praying that those head in the right direction for her. Both knee and eye. So, okay. Who else? Let me share a couple that I have while you think about it. Uh, please keep uh, Amber Thomas and Ethan Barnick in prayer. Um, we had a, a great day yesterday. Started off a little cold, but ended up to be a beautiful day for a wedding. Uh, so uh, we were out in Salix at a place called the Log Cabin. Anybody ever been there? It's tucked away in a little corner and uh, it was a nice little venue. Had a nice wedding there for both Amber and Ethan. I'll show you a picture a little bit later on. Want to keep AJ back there in prayer as well for healing for his arm. Uh, my friend Jim Simcoe uh, for his health and upcoming surgery for some catheterization and stents in his heart. 
want to keep the Albright family in prayer. Uh, many of you know that uh, Ralph is down in Kentucky doing a lot of storm damage, flood damage, cleanup. Um, Tess and Em and Alyssa are there as well visiting, so keep them in prayer for safe travel. I uh, want to keep the Baker family in prayer for just some grace and some mercy. I want to keep Oe uh, Hofecker in prayer. Uh, he is out on a uh, hunting trip in the high country in Colorado for the next week. So safety for him out there and safety for travel as they travel back here next week. I want to keep uh, Selena's mom, Teresa, in prayer, uh, healing for her brain tumor. That's uh, Selena Tawney. Again, I want to keep uh, Sierra in prayer as she's undergoing surgery this week, again, for uh, complete healing as they've asked. And these couple came from last week on cards. Uh, Miss Kathy Frederick has an unspoken. Also, the Donna Birkebau family for grief in her passing. Uh, Jeannie lifted this one up for her friend Amber, who has uh, breast cancer and is undergoing radiation treatments. Um, and I want to keep uh, Charlene's uh, in laws, uh, Melvin and Betty Taylor, in prayer. They were dealing with COVID, and in the midst of that, uh, Betty had a stroke. So I uh, want to keep uh, that family in prayer as well. Anything else? Miss Charlene. Uh, Linda and Gary. Uh, Linda is in the hospital. She's been in for a week and still. They're saying she has a broken ankle. But I talked to her yesterday and they still haven't really did anything with her ankle yet. It's, uh, so we saw the scenery out the church and see what he's been up to. But, okay. So she's been in a week and he's been alone for a week. So okay. I know about them too. So keep uh, Linda in prayer. That's the first that I heard. So, okay, thank you for that. appreciate it. Uh, where's she at? Connemaw? Yeah. Charlene? Okay, good. All right. Um, also, uh, keep the ongoings uh, in Ukraine in your prayers. Uh, if you follow the news at all, you've heard that Russia has escalated their mobilization for the war. Um, They've said that they're calling up only 300,000 uh, soldiers that are already kind of trained. It doesn't appear by news reports that I've been reading that that's so. They're conscripting people. Um, you've also heard the, the, the threats, if you're paying attention to the news, of some uh, kind of ominous threats of nuclear war. I don't know where we are in the big scope of the world picture. But uh, it is interesting to think about a little bit the goings-on that's happening around the world. Um, I, I don't profess to be prophetic or prognosticate the future. But I will say this. It really is time for the world to turn its attention back to the Lord. Because it is crumbling apart. And I think the Lord is moving in powerful ways, in ways that we don't fully understand, in ways that Scripture has given us a little insight to. Um, and if we don't soon start thinking about the Lord more than politics and climate change and all this other stuff, um, we are going to be in a serious world of hurt. Um, I think there's a wake-up call going in the world for us to draw close to God again and turn our face back to God again, and uh, we should do it. And I think, uh, you know, it's, I always think about it like the frog in the pot story. You know the frog in the pot story? They threw him in there and turned on the heat, and it started to get warmer and warmer, and the frog didn't realize what was happening. Um, I think that's kind of what's happening in our world today. Things happen a little at a time, and we don't really fully grasp um, the big picture. So be in prayer uh, for Ukraine, that there might be some peace uh, with Russia, and we might stop the madness, and there wouldn't be an escalation into something much more dire for our world. Um, so keep that in prayer as well. Anybody else? Go ahead, Karen. For all the hurricanes and tornadoes and Yeah, please keep uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and all of that in prayer. They got hammered pretty good by by tropical storm, but it had some hurricane force winds. So, 
Anything else? Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Spend some time silently praising God, asking for your own requests or one that you heard, and I'll close this up. Join me as we pray. Lord, today as we settle ourselves before you and humble our hearts, we start by simply saying, Lord, we're grateful again for your goodness and grace and blessings. We're grateful that you've given us the word of God, the scriptures, to help us how to live, but also to enlighten us, Lord, about future events. None of us can claim to know uh, what's going to happen tomorrow. But Lord, your word has given us a little bit of insight into um, a time is coming for all of us where this world as we know it will cease and come to an end. And that heaven, as we don't fully understand, will come here to reside on earth. And those that have given their hearts and lives to you, Lord, will reside with you and live on into an eternity. And those that have dismissed you, those that have ignored you, those that have mocked you will find a consequence, Lord, uh, that really is, is hard to grasp. But Lord, today we are gathered here as believers. We believe what your word has to say. We believe that you are who you are. And we simply ask God for you to move in some powerful ways. We know that you're a patient God, a merciful God, a God filled with compassion and grace. And we know, Lord, that uh, the world is moving on and that you're patiently waiting so that as many people as possible will come to know you as Lord and Savior. So, Lord, we pray for a massive movement of revival in our world. We pray for Ukraine and Russia and all of the, the hatred and evil and, and just, uh, just the terrible sickness of evil that's going on, Lord, that... Uh, uh, there would be uh, some way for there to be some resolutions in Europe, in Ukraine, in Russia, and that we might be able to again find some peace, Lord. We know that peace starts with you, and we pray, Lord, that you would move powerfully in people's hearts to rise up, Lord, and just uh, blow back against all of the evil here that's in our land and in the world. Lord, help us to live boldly for you. We thank you today, Lord, that uh, we've been able to lift up a lot of these requests. There are requests here for healing and for grace and mercy and wisdom and safety. Lord, we know that you hear these prayers. We know that you know every person that's been spoken and lifted up. We know, Lord, that you know everything about us. So we pray that you would move again with power over these, this list, Lord, and that uh, your will would be accomplished in each and every way, that you would put your hedge of protection around every person that have been named here and those that have been unspoken and just uh, protect them from all harm and evil. Bring your grace and healing and blessing to each and every one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, bro. <clears throat> If any of those statements are true that you've just seen on the video, 
then you'll want to join us through uh, the month of October here as we look at this new series that I'm starting called Redeeming Your Time. When you think about time, it is certainly a precious commodity. You know, you can work more and you can make more money, but you can't work more and make more time. You can't buy more time. You can't trade for more time. There's only so much of it, and it's precious. Each year, we're given 8,766 hours to use as we please. Now, for you brainiacs who are on your phone already with the calculator going 365 times 24 does not equal 8,766, because I know somebody out there is going to do it. Remember that, you know, the earth spins in such a way that we add six hours every year. That's why we have a leap year every four years to allow the calendar and our seasons to keep up. So for all of you out there that's doing the math, that's the correct math, 8,766 hours. We all live to be 99. If we all live to be 99, that means we'll only have 867,834 hours to use in this life. And everybody, every bedside that I've been beside are people who have been at the end of their life have said it's gone too fast, it was too short. It really wasn't a lot of time. Even the Bible says time is precious. And we only have so much of it. Job chapter 14 and verse 5 says, Man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. Now I want to put a little disclaimer here about this, this because um, yes, our days are determined. But that is not license for you to live recklessly or foolishly. Some people would argue, well, you know, God's already determined when I'm going to die, so I can live however I want and do whatever I want because I'm not going to die until God says I'm going to die. That's a stupid argument, okay? Because we can sure, certainly shorten our lifespan by living carelessly, by living stupid. But here's the interesting thing. We cannot add to it. Today, if your life is busy, if you're feeling overwhelmed or swamped by your to-do list, uh, this series is really for you. The solution to our constant struggle with time management is found in Jesus Christ. And he really shows us how God would manage his time. The dilemma here is, is that you have to dig into the word to figure that out. So the question this morning is, is does God really care how we spend our time today? And I, I believe that he does. I believe that God really does care how, he, how we spend our time. I believe that he tells us to redeem our time. Now that term redeeming our time or redeeming your time comes from the book of Ephesians chapter 5 starting in verse 15. And if you read through the book of Ephesians... Through the first four chapters or so, Paul describes God's great love for us and his rich mercy and his saving grace. He goes through all of that in the first four chapters. And then the Apostle Paul reminds us as he heads into Ephesians chapter 5 of our status as dearly loved children of God. That's our status. When you give your heart to Jesus Christ, you now become a child of God, right? And he then reminds us of what our response to our adoptions as sons and daughters of God should be. Once we've been adopted, we have a response, right? And he says in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 15, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, verse 16, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, for a bit more clarity, let's look at it in the New Living Translation. It says, verse 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Remember what I just said? You can shorten your life by being stupid, right? But like those who are wise, that's how we're to live. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. 
Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Paul is simply saying, part of our response to the gospel is to redeem our time, to manage our time as carefully and wisely as possible, to make the most of every opportunity, because why? The days are evil. Now the Greek word that's used here for that word redeeming, it literally means to buy up or to ransom or to rescue from loss. What do you waste your time on? If you've ever said, I wish I could buy more time, that's the idea we're talking about here. As Christians, we are to buy up as much time as we can. Why? So that we can spend it on ourselves, right? So we can find our own pleasures, right? No, that's not the reason. We're called to redeem our time because the days are evil and we're running out of time to do the will of the Lord. So how do we redeem our time? That's what we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. And we're going to look at how the author of time managed his time when he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. There's great stuff here as you read the Gospels, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you can't help but start to realize that Jesus was the most productive person who ever lived. I mean, think about it for a minute. He lived till he was what? 33. And he started his ministry when? When he's 30. Look what he accomplished in three years in ministry, right? So we're going to look at his life and how he managed his time, which was very counterculturally, I might add, and see how we can apply those same principles to our own lives here 2000, some 2,000 years later. Now, I want to start with a passage that I think we all pretty much know. It's pretty well known. And it's from Luke. And the passage really is to illustrate how Jesus is the ultimate solution to our time management problems. Um, if you look in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 22, it says, One day Jesus says to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and they, they set out, right? And as they sailed... Jesus fell asleep, and a squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. So here we have the disciples out on the lake, right? They're enjoying a quiet sail with Jesus, when all of a sudden things start to spiral out of control, the weather changes kind of rapidly, and their boat's starting to take on water. Now you can imagine this scene a little bit. If you're a fisherman, you probably understand this from real life. But the boat's taking on water from every side. And, and the disciples are frantically trying to bail out the water. And the more they're bailing out, the more they're looking around the boat, and there's more water than there was before. Sounds a little bit like our never-ending to-do list, right? Seems like you never get done with your to-do list. Luke says the boat was being swamped. Which really only left the disciples one thing to do. They recognized that they, they, they couldn't calm all this chaos that was going on all around them on their own. So the disciples woke Jesus and they begged him to help. Look at verse 24. It tells us what happened. It says, Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Now this is the point that I want to make to you about the busyness in your life. The point from this passage is really kind of simple. Jesus offers you peace before you do anything. Don't we get all wound up and stressed out in life? I want you to think about that. When you're in the midst of some storm somewhere, remember, God has already given you the peace that you need. Jesus offers you the peace before you do anything. Our culture says, it constantly throws at us this work, works-based productivity. You know, the world says, well, they claim that if you do X, Y, and Z, then you're going to find peace. If you do this, that, and the other thing, you'll find peace. But you know, that's contrary to what the Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches a grace-based productivity. 
which says that through Jesus Christ we already have peace. We already have peace. Was Jesus really excited and upset that the boat was taken on water? What was he doing? Taking a nap, right? <clears throat> we already have peace. We do time management exercises X, Y, and Z really as a response of worship. Again, look at the disciples in the swamp boat. The disciples didn't do anything to calm the chaos. They didn't do anything to calm it. They merely trusted Jesus to still the storm. And the point here is this. You and I can do the same. By trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, Romans 5 and 1 says we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. That peace comes regardless of how productive we are or how well we steward our time. In the words of author Matt Perryman, he says, For Christians, peace comes first. Hear me. Peace comes first, not second. The mistake we often make is to make peace. The mistake we often make is to make peace of mind the result of things we do rather than the source. Understand, you already have peace. Jesus has given it to you. Here's the truth. Time management tactics will never be your most foundational source of peace. As Christians, our ultimate source of peace, our ultimate solution to being swamped, is found in Jesus Christ sleeping through the storm. Was he panicked about all that? No. As the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. So here's the point. The next time you find yourself swamped, find peace in the idea that Jesus Christ will get you through it, whatever it is. Even if you don't know exactly what to do next, Jesus will get you through it. I gotta admit to you, I have, I have a struggle with that sometimes, a lot of times. I get stressed out about stuff that happens. But this is a constant reminder that there's not a lot of things to stress out about. And I always kind of find it funny and repentant, really, like back to church Sunday. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's got to happen. There's a lot of pieces that have got to come together. And it's stressful. You know, and leading up to that, you know, one day my cardiologist is going to say, what did you do with your life? Why does your heart look the way that it does? I don't know. But after the event, you go, wow, that all really came together awesomely. And I have to ask myself, why was you stressing about it from the beginning? Jesus is going to get you through it. He's going to take care of it. He's going to get you there where you need to do, even if you exactly don't know what you need to do next. And I can tell you from my own life, that happens over and over and over and over again. And sadly, I continue to stress about things and realize every time, God's got you through that. God knows what's going on. He's going to help you through whatever storm or whatever, whatever, whatever your to-do list has, has got you swamped out at. So now that we've established that our place in God's family is really secure, we still want to be better stewards of our time, right? I mean, we only have so much of it. So what does the scripture have to say about time and our role in it? Well, I want to look at five quick things this morning. Five quick things that you might have not thought about in a long time. Here's the first truth. Our longing for timelessness is good and it's God-given. I want you to be honest with yourself. Most of us have a strong desire to live forever. Is that not true? We really would. And we also long to be productive forever. Now, we don't feel like this every day because sin has made work in our efforts to be productive very difficult. That's what sin has done. But something in our souls and in God's word shows us that work was meant to be very good. You think about the last time you did some sort of a project the last time that you uh, created something, the last time you painted something, the last time you did something and you stepped back from it and you went, that was awesome. 
and you kind of purview it and you look all over it and you're really happy of your success and that it's really working good and it looks good. You ever feel that way? You ever feel that way about what you've accomplished? You really feel this matter of success? That's what God intended work to be. God, God intended it to be good. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Work was meant to be very good. The Hebrew word for work here is the word uh, avado, avadova, which is also translated to mean worship in our Bibles. Work existed before the fall of mankind, pre-sin. And work was good. And work was more than good. Work was worship. Think about it as you stand back from something you've just created and the good feeling that you have about accomplishing. Now I know that some Christians believe that this longing for timelessness is rooted in pride. I'm glad we don't have to live forever because of some of the pain and suffering that humans go through. But really, if we're honest with ourselves, we really do want to go on forever. And I'm convinced that this desire to live and be productive forever was designed by God himself. Ecclesiastes 3.11 makes this crystal clear when it says that he, being God, has set eternity in the hearts of men. Do you see that? God has set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Something in our God-designed DNA tells us that we were made for something more. To be human is to work with time that our minds tell us is limited, but our souls tell us, assure us really, that it shouldn't be limited. So why is time limited? Well, that leads us to the next truth. Truth number two says sin has ensured that we will all die with unfinished work. I oftentimes sit around and think about my to-do list that goes in my head and I have to write mine down. My wife doesn't have to write hers down. She, she normally gets up every day with a to-do list in her head and she can rattle through that pretty well. Me, I have to write mine down. But I often think about the things that I don't get accomplished. And the reason why that is is because sin has ensured that we will all die with unfinished work. When sin entered the world, death was ushered in alongside it. We see this in Genesis chapter 3 starting in verse 17. It says, To Adam, God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now here's an interesting thing to think about. After the fall of human beings who were created to be immortal, God set it up in the beginning that it was perfect, right? The Garden of Eden. Before the fall, we were created to be immortal. After the fall, we became mortal. Work, which was created to be good, became difficult. Time, which was created to be endless, became limited. In short, sin has ensured that nobody will ever finish the work they envision completing in their lifetime. Now, I know that sounds depressing, but it's true. We are all going to die with unfinished business. Our to-do list will never be completed. There's always going to be a gap between what we can imagine accomplishing in this life and what we can actually get done. But thank goodness that sin does not have the final say. Because here's truth number three. God will finish the work that we leave unfinished. Let's recap for a minute. God created us to live forever. 
But sin has broken creation and made us mortal and time-bound and limited. So where is the hope? Our hope really is found in Jesus Christ. He walked out of the tomb that first Easter morning with a redeemed body that could never ever be destroyed again. The resurrection was Jesus' way of declaring that our longing for immortality has been right all along and that through him we too can experience eternal life. But Easter wasn't just the beginning of eternal life. Easter marked the launch of God's eternal kingdom. Things were going to be different now. Somehow <clears throat> this ties into time management and redeeming our time. And we're going to look at that over the next seven weeks. But to simplify the Christian story, God created us to live and to work with him in a perfect garden. And sin came along and messed all that up. But God promised to send a king to set everything right. And with his defeat of death at Easter, Jesus proved very strongly, emphatically actually, that he was the promised king. And everything from that moment to the end of Revelation is about building God's kingdom until Jesus returns to finish what he started at the resurrection and make everything new. Isn't that a great hope? Jesus is coming one day and he's going to make everything new. No more pain and suffering and hurt and sickness. No more dying. So what does this mean for us in the present? Well, Paul gives us some clues in 1 Corinthians 15. Starting in verse 58, he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, Paul says, For we are co-workers in God's service, you are God's field, God's building. Did you hear that? You're a co-worker with God. In Genesis, God created a lot in six days. But what's equally remarkable is what he did not create. The first few days of creation was God setting up this canvas and on the sixth day, it's when he passed the baton of creation to us. We're his image bearers, right? And he calls us to fill that canvas up. Literally, if you read in Genesis, he says to fill the earth. Fill the earth with things that point to his glory. My question to you this morning is, how are we doing with that? God created a canvas. He's turned it over us to build his kingdom with things that point to his glory. How are we doing with that? The same thing happened on Easter morning. Jesus inaugurated his kingdom with his resurrection. But he left the work of building for the kingdom to us until he returns to finish the work once and for all. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, God always wanted to work in his world through loyal human beings. That's how God made it, to work through us. But because God alone will finish that work and ultimately bring heaven to earth, we can embrace this freeing truth today. God doesn't need you or me to finish our to-do list. If the things on our to-do list are on God's to-do list, He'll complete them with or without us. Whatever God wants finished, He'll finish. Which leads us to another liberating truth. You and I really have all the time that we need. That's why this next truth is so powerful. The gospel is our source of rest and ambition. The gospel is the source of rest and ambition. The gospel is there to tell us when to rest. We can see when Jesus rested. We can see what Jesus did. 
It's there to encourage us. As we've seen, God really doesn't need us to be productive. But if we're honest, we often need ourselves to be productive in order to feel some sense of worth. We did nothing to earn God's grace. And there's nothing that we can do to lose it. No matter how productive we are in this life, your status as an adopted child of God will never ever change as long as you've given your heart to Jesus. But you know, isn't that what starts to make us kind of wildly productive? If you've given your heart to Jesus, isn't it, isn't it more exhilarating to work for somebody that you love? When you have to work to earn somebody's favor, that's exhausting. But God has already said he loves you. He's redeemed you. He's filled you with peace. He's poured out unconditional favor on you. When you start to work for somebody like that, that's kind of intoxicating. It's kind of exhilarating. So what is God's agenda? How can we work for his kingdom and redeem our time? Well, again, let's go back and look at the scripture for a minute. It reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 that we are God's workmanship. Don't ever think that you're not a masterpiece. And don't ever think that you can decide to do better in your own creation, creating yourself. You're God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In Matthew 5 and 16, Jesus says in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, we often misinterpret that word or that phrase, good works. We often think that it refers to doing some charity or some ministry work. But when we look at the Greek word for good works, it simply is translated to mean work or task or employment. Remember that before the fall of mankind, work was good. It was part of God's perfect world. And Jesus himself reaffirmed the goodness of what we call secular work. He was what? For 30 years? A carpenter, right? He roughly spent 80% of his adult life working as a carpenter. As long as your work is not contrary to God's word, it can be considered good work. Remember what I said a, a week or so ago about, you know, that's where God really wants you to share him. That person that you work beside, that you look into their eyes and you hear the stories about their kids and their family and the new car they bought. So as we go about our lives and work advancing God's kingdom, where can we look for practical wisdom on how to redeem our time? That leads us to the last truth. We know how God would manage his time. We know that. Because he's given it to us in his word. When the author of time became flesh. Think about this. When Jesus became fully human. He experienced the exact same day challenges other mortals faced. He had a business to run. He had a mother and father to take care of. He had hunger to manage. He had the need for sleep. And you know what? He faced the same 24 hour time constraint that every other human being faces. As a human being, Jesus was challenged to steward his time on earth much like we are today. And we see this illustrated through the, throughout the Gospels. Jesus said in John chapter 9, as long as it is a day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming where no one can work. In John 17 and verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you've given me to do. So how could 
first century Jerusalem compared to what we deal with today. I mean, Jesus didn't have thousands of emails to go through. He didn't get text messages. He didn't have a smartphone. He wasn't in virtual meetings. He didn't have all the distractions that we have now. Surely it was much easier to manage his time, right? But you know, we see it time and time again that Jesus was constantly interrupted. He was constantly having to make choices about his priorities. And he was constantly saying no to people. You know, we can find ourselves busy all the time. And I hear lots of excuses of how busy I am from you. But you know, Jesus had those same choices to make about being busy. What kind of busy work are you busy at? Hebrews 4 and 15 reminds us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. In the person of Jesus, the word became flesh, ensuring that he could sympathize with our weaknesses, including our efforts to redeem our time. Let me close with this thought. Throughout the rest of this series, we're going to look through seven principles from the Gospels that show us how Jesus redeemed his time. Jesus, you know, said no to a lot of good things. And some of us need to figure out how to say no to some good things. Do you understand what I'm saying? To help lean out our schedule so that we can be a little more focused on God and what God is calling us to do. So I'll leave you with the first and I believe the most important step to redeeming our time. And that's to start with the Word of God. I'm convinced anymore in the world today that part of the reason that we live the way that we live and the world is going the way that it's going is because we really don't know what God says anymore. We are now so many generations removed from really what the Bible says that the world is getting crazier and crazier. Start with the word. To redeem our time in the model of our redeemer. If we're going to redeem our time, we, 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 we first got to know the author of time. And we've got to figure out what his purposes for the world are. And what he's called us to do with the time that he's given us. And it's all right there in your Bible on your phone. Jesus frequently broke away from the crowds and his disciples to spend time alone with his father. For us, that can look like this. Read some scripture daily. Meditate on what you read. Pray throughout your day. And here's the thing when we talk about time management. It really doesn't have to be fancy. And I'm not saying to you, you know, you need to spend three hours meditating, praying, and reading the scripture. Just carve out a little time. And dig into the scripture and see what God has to say about our time and how we should spend it. And please don't take my word for it. Dig into it and hear it from the source, okay? Everybody has the availability in this country, in this room, in the sound of my voice, to read the scriptures on their own. Dig in and see what God has to say about managing your time. I run into a lot of people, myself included, that are stressed out because we are so busy. Maybe we really need to think about the things that we're doing and really see if it aligns with what God wants us to do versus what we want to do. Pray with me. Father, we know the days are evil and fleeting. Give us the fortitude and wisdom to steward our time well 
so that we can best serve your kingdom. Constantly renew our minds with the promise that we have peace first as your child. We need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded, Lord, when the storms come, that you'll guide us through. We need to be reminded that sometimes we need to say no in our busy schedules. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to respond in love to you for all that you've done to us. Show us the way to redeem our time that we might be able to give more time to you and the good works that you call us to do. Lord, we give you our praise today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is a worker. Let's stand up and give him some praise. He is the way maker and he is here and he is always working.
couple of announcements quick, have a seat. Again, uh, if you can help with Sunday school and the nursery, those kinds of things, we would appreciate it. Uh, see Susie back there and we'll get you fixed up. Uh, you can do it. You can do it. Bible study Wednesdays, this Wednesday coming at Andrea Liebfried's. I think this is week three coming up. So uh, midway through, if you uh, need some directions, see me, see Denise. We'll get you there uh, if you'd like to jump in. Uh, also, this week coming up, just a reminder to you on Tuesday is this Ball Ladies Teen Encounter uh, over in the Cove area at Cove Mountain Road in Roaring Spring. If you're interested, there's some flyers on the board and in the back there on the table. Um, next week is Love Feast and Communion. Go ahead and flip that next one up. Uh, again, we'll do some uh, feet and hand washing, bread and cup communion, uh, bring a covered dish, a meat and play settings and drink provided. Uh, invite a friend. Um, you can participate as you uh, feel uh, you need, so don't fret about that. Um, we don't force anybody to do the feet and hand washing or any of that, but we encourage you to come. Next week we're going to be talking about letting your yes be yes and your no be no. One of the hardest things in my life is to say the word what? No. no. <laughs> it's true. But you know, that's a major part of redeeming your time and the time factor, right? Um, I'm one of those folks that when somebody calls and says, hey, can you help me out? I have a hard time saying no, even if I got a hundred other things to do that's important. So uh, be here for that next week. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else up there? Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Barnick, Amber Thomas and Ethan Barnick married yesterday, um, sweet couple. Uh, they already have uh, two little kids uh, together and uh, it was good to help them do the right thing and get pointed in the right direction. It was a blessing. So uh, keep them in your prayers. Uh, they live over down off the mountain now. He got a job uh, as assistant manager on a big farm and uh, they're doing pretty well. So. God's blessings to them. Uh, anything else we need to know? Birthdays. Birthdays. Whose birthdays today? Whose? Yeah, uh, Lisa Horn's birthday is today. Yeah, Lisa Horn. Who else is it? Chris. She had one. Oh, she had one. She don't like anybody to talk about her birthday. Yeah, see see that <laughs> won't be here oh jeez alright go forth into the world trusting with your hearts the wisdom God bestows upon all who seek to follow God's will when called to lead do so with humility and confidence in God be in this world a sign of Jesus presence share compassion with all whom you encounter live wisely in God's name and glorify God in all that you do. And may the grace and mercy and wisdom of God be our support, guidance, and strength from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. Have a great, great week. Don't forget about communion next week. See you then at 10 o'clock.